All right. So next, if you're following me along on page 155 of uh, Mary and Nicole's um, Anatomy and Physiology book, you'll come to the section about sweat gland. All right. Now, these are various glands that are found within the skin that are considered exocrine glands that produce and release their secretions to the outer surface of the body. All right. And remember, by definition, an exocrine gland is a gland that, that for example, is, for starters, and again, this is going to be a very rudimentary picture here, but is a gland that has a duct. Okay, it's a gland like any other type of gland. It's composed of epithelial cells, and it produces its secretions and releases the secretions out of the gland via a duct over a very short distance. All right, and then that duct is going to open up to a body surface somewhere, all right? Now, that body surface doesn't necessarily have to be an external body surface. I know I see a lot of students who think of exocrine glands as secretions that travel outside of the body, okay? But not every exocrine gland does this. There's all, I mean, a lot of the common ones that you think of do, all right? But, for example, the pancreas has exocrine functions to it. And, you know, remember, you know, you know by that, so if you take the stomach, on this... Part of my art here, folks. So you've got the stomach, and then you've got the pancreas, like so. The pancreas has a duct that travels, that spans almost the entire length of itself, and that duct opens up into the duodenum, the first eight to ten inches of the small intestine. All right, and the pancreas, you know, the main job of the pancreas is to produce digestive enzymes and buffers, and to secrete them into the lumen of the small intestine, all right, and that is an exocrine function, all right, you know, this, you know, the secretion is traveling out of this gland through a tube, okay, onto another body surface somewhere, all right, so that's not a secretion that is traveling out of the body, so remember that exocrine glands release their secretions through tubes over short distances onto body surfaces, okay, that's what exocrine glands do, all right. And all these different types, all these examples of glands in the skin that we're going to talk about are examples of exocrine glands. All right. So the first example that we're going to talk about are called eccrine sweat, are called eccrine glands. And these are what people refer to as sweat glands. Okay, sweat glands. Now, the secretions from eccrine glands, or I should say these eccrine glands are found in their highest concentrations on the palms of the hands, on the forehead, um, you know, on the soles of the feet, okay, in those areas in their highest concentration. I'll found in other areas as well, you know, the, you know, other areas of the skin. I mean, you guys have seen sweat before on yourselves, but those are the areas where they're found the most, okay? And eccrine glands, like I said, produce sweat, and what sweat is, it's a hypotonic solution, meaning primarily water, okay, but, but sweat does have other solutes within it. Okay, you know, sweat has salts, okay, metabolic waste, all right, basically, um, you know, very small substances that can be filtered out, because remember, as we talked about the functions of skin, um, you know, we do eliminate some waste products via sweat, all right, and um, now these are, these glands are controlled by the sympathetic nervous system, all right, and we'll talk about the sympathetic nervous system more in depth when we get to the, the chapter on the nervous system. But basically, this, you know, when these glands are activated by the sympath, you know, these glands are activated by the sympathetic nervous system. So basically, what happens, we increase blood flow to the skin. Blood flows through capillaries. Remember, capillaries are blood vessels with pores in them. Remember, we discussed filtration in, a, in another video. All right. And as you pump, you know, blood through a tube that has a hole in it, you're going to filter out the fluids, you know, the water. All right, and then that gland will then basically take that water and any small solutes that um, that that uh, are escaped from the blood and secrete it again out of a tube onto the surface of the skin. All right, and then that's basically what sweat is. That's where sweat comes from, the blood. All right, and that's why you have to be careful when you are outside and you're sweating a lot. Um, you know, this can cause death. You know, if it gets to be severe enough. Because sweat will cause, you know, excessive sweating will cause dehydration, okay? And, um, and what will happen, because remember, this is water, you know, this fluid, this sweat, that's water that's coming from your blood, the plasma of your blood, all right? Yeah. All right, sorry, folks. All right, so what will happen if you sweat too much, 
you're going to have a severe drop in blood volume. Okay, and if you have a drop in blood volume, you're going to have a drop in blood pressure. All right, and as you lose blood, you're going to have a hard time perfusing, meaning getting blood into your vital organs, and that's going to start causing you to shut down. Okay, plus, as you start to lose water, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to produce as much sweat, and, and, and the combination of you overheating and um, you not having enough water to eliminate heat um, will kill you. Okay, that's why you, you know you need to make sure that before you do something you know physically active, you you stay properly hydrated. Um, you know you drink enough water so your blood volume is high enough so you can you know crank out enough sweat. And also it's important to stay hydrated while you are you know while you're performing some kind of physical activity as well to maintain that blood volume because you're going to continue to produce sweat to regulate body temperature. All right. Um, now, also, when these eccrine glands are active, some, you know, you will see visible droplets of sweat on the skin, and that's what you're going to call diaphoresis. All right, you know, that's a word you're going to see a lot. You know, for example, if someone is having a heart attack, you know, you, you know, or, or a severe panic attack, or you know, let's go with a heart attack. All right, when someone's having a heart attack, they, you know, you may see on their medical chart they are diaphoretic. Okay, when we say someone is experiencing diaphoresis or they're diaphoretic, what that means is, is you visibly see drops of sweat on the skin. They're producing enough sweat so you can actually see it on the skin. That's diaphoresis, okay? And clinically, that's important because, you know, in high levels of stress, which activate the sympathetic nervous system, all right, that can, you know, that can tell a lot about what's going on with the person, all right? So those are eccrine glands. Apocrine glands, what these are, these are not found as abundantly as eccrine glands. These produce, you know, again, uh, water, but also they produce, you know, a combination of water, um, some fats, you know, oil. Okay, they release some proteins. All right. Um, and these glands are found in their highest concentration in the pubic areas and in the axillary areas of the body. All right, and their overall function really is not well known. There really isn't a, a good description of their function out there. But what, it, but, but what I can say about these is that the activity of these glands become very heightened during puberty and um, also during sexual activity. All right, so, you know, so the hormonal aspects of puberty and the hormonal changes that occur, you know, during, you know, the sexual the act of, you know, how that process works, um, you know, during that, you know, uh, during those times will increase the activity of these. Now, um, what happens then as you move these secretions, as you, as you secrete these on, you know, onto the skin, you know, you have bacteria on your skin, all right? And bacteria can break down these, these fats and these proteins. This is food for them. And as a result, you know, the bacteria are going to digest these, produce gases, and that's going to create an odor, kind of a, a musky odor, um, if you want to call it that. And that's a big part of where body odor comes from. All right, that's a, yeah, all right. So that's basically apocrine glands. All right, and ceruminous glands. You know, you find these in high concentrations in the ears. Okay, and these produce cerumen. All right, cerumen is the high class term for earwax. All right, and cerumen again is an oily substance that is, you know, just produced to keep the ears moist and to protect the ears. And think of it as the equivalent of mucus for the respiratory system. All right, mucus in the in the respiratory system is designed to trap any foreign debris from and prevent it from getting into the lungs. All right, this cerumen helps to humidify the ears and also prevent any foreign debris from getting into the ears. You know, especially pathogenic agents. Okay, remember pathogenic meaning being sick. All right, and for heaven's sakes, people do not candle. What a, what a, here I've been hearing a lot of, uh, about people candling their ears. I don't know. They're taking lighting candles, taking wax, putting their ears to pull out the cerumen. Bad idea. I mean, for starters, think, don't stick flaming hot objects in your ears or out of your either use black. I don't know exactly how that works, but people like it because they say it feels great. You pull out all the earwax, but at the same time, you need that wax in there, okay? Because like I said, that does help to protect your ears. So if you want to try it once, just to say you stuck candle wax in your ear, fine, but don't do it on a regular basis, okay? And last but not least, there's another type of gland in the body that are called sebaceous glands, all right? And sebaceous glands are not sweat glands, per se. They're, they're primarily oil-secreting glands. These glands produce and secrete a lot of fats, okay? I mean, obviously, they, so they secrete a lot of oil, um, and their secretion is called sebum, 
All right. Now these these glands are typically found near hairs of the body. All right. So they're found in high concentration around hairs, and they produce their they you know so they produce their oily. So let's say here's the skin. You've got a hair down here, and the hair is bulging out of the skin like so. And then you'll find this gland kind of sitting right around you know the the, the roots of the hair. All right. And then it's going to release its secretions, and the secretions are going to travel up the, uh, up to the superficial aspects of the hair. All right, you know these glands help keep the hair moist um, and humidified, and also there are antibodies in here. Um, you know specifically the IgA. Well, you'll learn about that in the, the lymphatic and immune system. And this antibody is used to um, basically for, you find this is an antibody you find in all body secretions, and like any other antibody, it's designed to protect you from basically foreign invaders. So this antibody is going to stick to bacteria and basically, you know, start being you know, healthy, you know, hate and killing them. All right. So, and again, uh, sebum is more highly, you find sebum secreted a lot more during certain hormonal situations, like for example, puberty. All right. And if you want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, for example, you guys have probably heard of whiteheads, blackheads, and acne. All right, what happens when people get whiteheads uh, are when the ducts of sebaceous glands get blocked, okay? Then their secretions just sit there, and then that's when you form a whitehead, okay, when they just stay blocked in the duct, all right? And then if, if bacteria get in there and start to break down those, the, break down the, you know, the, the, the fats and the oils and those secretions, then, the, then, that can, then that'll make the secretion you know, turn black, and that's what a blackhead is, all right? And then acne is when... Basically, you know, you have a sebaceous gland, all right, and then bacteria get in there, all right, and then you have inflammation going on, so you increase blood flow to the area, and then you have inflammation, and then basically the, you know, your, your immune system, your phagocytes and such, or neutrophils, are going to be trying to kill the bacteria and get them out of the gland, all right, because this is a very, very good area. I mean, that's a place bacteria want to be, okay? It's, it's kind of, it's, you know, it's just underneath the skin. It's, it's got a very great source of food. I mean, it basically, it's basically swimming in food with all the fat in there. And it's fairly sheltered from the blood and the immune system. So, I mean, that's a good place for bacteria to, to get into. So when you have increased blood flow to an infected sebaceous gland, that's basically what, you know, what we call zits or acne. All right? And, and don't pop the things. All right? Just let them heal on their own. All right? Because think about it. If you pop this, all right, if you guys see pus come out of here, the pus is typically yellow and white. All right? The yellow is the tissue debris and the bacteria that's in here, and you know possibly some you know secretion as well. And then the white are the white blood cells that you're that you're bursting out of there to try to kill the bacteria. And if any red comes out, that means you broke open capillaries, all right. And as a result, um, you know you have a little bit of bleeding out of that area as well, all right. Let the things heal, leave them be, all right. So ladies, I know you like to pop zits on guys, you know please don't. Men don't let them do that. Okay. Um, so overall, you know, because the problem with this is, I mean, it, it's it's rare, but it can happen. When you know, so when you develop the, another term for this is a sebaceous cyst. Okay, a sebaceous cyst. So basically, a cyst is you know, you have a pocket of you know an infection, a bunch of fluid build up and sac around it. All right. So then what happens? Um, you know, if you if you break this open, and it, there there is a chance that bacteria may get into the bloodstream, all right, and that bacteria may circulate around the bloodstream, and that's what we call sepsis, all right, and you know that's you know very very bad that can kill you. Now, like I said, the chances of that happening are low, but the chance is there, all right. So just leave the stinking zits alone, let them go away. I know they're not the most aesthetically pleasing things in the world, okay, but you know they're not going to kill you, all right. So these are the various glands you find in skin and their, in their basic 